إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب العزيز وأستعيد بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولنبلونكم ولنبلونكم حتى نعلم المجاهدين منكم والصابرين ونملو أخباركم وقال أحسب الناس أن يترك أن يقول آمنا وهم لا يفتنون صدق الله العظيم My dear respected elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته once again My talk today is about the trials and tribulations of the Prophet ﷺ. But first, prior to going into those things that are related to the Prophet ﷺ, and even before going into my talk, I just request everybody to be quiet and listen to the lecture, please. Because the words that are being spoken are not words which are ordinary words. These are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sayings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So to be chatting and talking while this talk is going on, it's extremely disrespectful. So if you do need to talk, just kindly step outside and talk outside inshallah. And if the brothers and sisters sitting here could pay attention, that would be wonderful inshallah. So trials and tribulations or ibtila, as the Arabic word is. Why do we have them? This is actually something that all of us will face one day. And it's part and parcel of being a Muslim, part and parcel of being a mu'min. That once you have accepted Iman, once you've accepted Islam, then for sure you're going to be tried and you're going to be tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us at the, at the beginning of Surah Al-Ankabut, Alif Lam Mim, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَن يُتْرَكُوا أَن يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Do people think that they're just going to say, Amanna, we have Iman, and they're not going to be tested? This is not the case. وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّا الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ We've tested everybody before. Each and every person that claimed to be a Muslim, each and every person that claimed to be a mu'min, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him and put him through trial and tribulation. So this is important for us to understand that we are all going to go through this trial. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that most certainly will test you. Okay? وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ most certainly we're going to test you in different ways. Sometimes you're going to have fear. Sometimes you're going to have hunger. Sometimes you're going to lose your job and you're not going to have money. Sometimes somebody's going to pass away. Sometimes you're going to be involved in a war. Sometimes you're going to have a tyrant that is ruling over you. And there are so many problems that we could be facing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives glad tidings to those people that stand firm in the face of these adversities and these difficulties. Allah says that a true mu'min, when he's going through these trials and tribulations, what does he say? الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةً قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Whenever they are faced with these difficulties and adversities, they simply say that this life is very short. This life is limited. The difficulties, the trials, the tribulations that I'm going to face in this world, they're going to finish one day. And I'm going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do they say? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can do whatever He likes with us. He can test us, he can put, through, put us through difficulty, he can put us through adversity. We're going to go back to him one day. The main focus of that person is, what am I doing to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And in that difficulty, 
he doesn't lose hope. This is the state of a mu'min. On the other hand, there are some people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them as worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the edge. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ حَرْفٍ There are some people that worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right on the edge of Iman. And as long as good is happening to them, as long as they are in a good situation, they say we'll worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِنْ أَصَابَهُ خَيْرٍ إِطْمَأَنَّ بِهِ وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ فِتْنَةٍ إِنْ قَلَبَ عَلَىٰ وَجْهِهِ As long as good is happening to the people, they say all fine and well. We're going to continue to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then when they are tried, and when they go through difficulty, in qalaba ala wajhi, they turn their backs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As if to say, I worshipped Allah for so long, I did this for so long, I prayed for so long, and then what do I end up with? I end up with this hardship. You know what? I don't need this anymore. I'm not going to worship Allah anymore because He owes me. He owes me and He didn't pay up when the time came. So this is the attitude of a person who is a wheeler and a dealer. A person who tries to bargain with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person who thinks that he should get payback for his worship in this world immediately. This is something that we are not supposed to be. So trials and tribulations, when they come to a believer, it actually fortifies his iman. It strengthens his belief. It strengthens his connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He makes more dua to Allah. He turns more to Allah in, in tahajjud, in qiyamul layl. And he makes more istighfar. Knowing that maybe it was possibly because of a, a mistake of mine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting me through this trial. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to elevate me in my status in the hereafter. That's why he's putting me through this trial. And he accepts it being from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Realizing the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَىٰ إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَىٰ Indeed, with every difficulty there is ease. With every difficulty, certainly there is ease. This is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why we as Muslims, as mu'mins, are going to go through hardship. For sure, it's going to happen to us one day. There is no such thing as a person going through life without having faced some kind of difficulty and, and hardship and adversity. It's going to happen sooner or later. The question is, how do we deal with it? Now, the Prophet Ali he gave us a stern warning. Not a stern warning, but he warned people that the closer you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more difficulty you're going to face. The closer you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more difficulty you will face. It is going to happen. He says in a hadith, أَشَدُّ النَّاسِ بَلَاءً الْأَنْبِيَاءِ ثُمَّ الصَّالِحُونَ ثُمَّ الْأَمْثَلْ فَالْأَمْثَلْ The people that face the most difficulties are the Anbiya والسلام, Then the pious people. Then according to their status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will face the most difficulties. So a person when he's going through hardship, he should not feel that you know, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving me a hard time. Maybe it is because of your closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are going through this hardship. Now how you deal with it is really a reflection of your iman. We look at the Prophet Ali salatu wasalam, how he, how his attitude was when he was going through this difficulty. How he remained positive and how he had a positive outlook on life in the most difficult of circumstances. It's a very famous story of Suraq ibn Malik, right? Prior to that story of Suraq ibn Malik, the Prophet Ali he's escaping Mecca. He's leaving Mecca and it's one of the most difficult decisions of his life that he's had to make. Allah SWT orders him to leave Mecca. And he basically is turning to the Kaaba and he's saying to the Kaaba, O oh Kaaba, O oh house of Allah, I love you so much, but what can I do? My people are turning me away. So he is leaving Mecca and people are basically trying to kill him that night. The night that he's leaving, they have 
told him that they planned already that they're going to murder him that particular night. He leaves and decides as the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to make hijrah to Medina. Prior to making that hijrah, he has to seek refuge in a cave with Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we know the story, right? The people, the trackers, they track the Prophet sallallahu and Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu right up to the cave. And if they only looked into the cave, they would have saw the Prophet sallallahu and Abu Bakr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Tawbah, إِلَّا تَنْسُرُوهُ فَقَدْ نَسَرَهُ اللَّهِ إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا ثَانِيَ اثْنَيْنِ إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا Look at the situation that they're in. You know, death is looking them in their eyes. The people of Quraysh are just standing outside the cave. All they had to do is look down and they would have seen both of them. At that difficult time, the Prophet Ali والسلام, is addressing Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and telling him, La tahzan. Don't be afraid. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is with us. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after that, He says, فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ وَأَيَّدَهُ بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا وَجَعَلَ كَلِمَةَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سُفْلَى وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَى when you have that kind of attitude, the sakina of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down. The peace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings help. And this is exactly what happened. They, they didn't see the Prophet sallallahu and Abu Bakr, and they left empty-handed. Further on in this story, a person who was enticed with the reward that the Quraysh were offering for the capture of the Prophet alayhi salatu a hundred camels, Suraq ibn Malik, he pursues them. He's an expert tracker. He's known for his tracking abilities to hunt and find humans and animals. And he tracks the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. As he sees them and he is running with his horse to try to catch both of them, his horse's feet slip into the sand and he falls. This was done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gets up, rides the horse again, tries to pursue them. His horse's feet sink into the sand and he falls again. This happens a number of times until the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he tells him, O oh, Suraqa, just accept this message of mine and I prom promise you the bracelets of the, Pers of the emperor of the Persian empire. Just imagine the attitude that the Prophet ﷺ is having in this difficult time. Again, he is staring death in the face. He has nothing to his name. He's leaving the city that he was born in and raised in. He's leaving his relatives, the people that he loves, and he's escaping and seeking refuge in a completely new town. But he tells Suraq ibn Malik that I promise you the bra bracelets of the emperor of Persia. Many years later, when the Persian Empire was conquered, Suraq ibn Malik was given these bracelets. He got them. The promise of the Prophet ﷺ was fulfilled. So again, the attitude. Some might say, well, the Prophet ﷺ was given wahi, so he had that positive attitude. But this it's still a lesson for us that how despite the odds despite the adversities the prophet sallallahu remained in this very positive state further on a very critical time that occurred with the muslims was the story of khandaq what happened at ghazwat khandaq also known as Ghazwat al-Ahzab mentioned in Surah al-Ahzab Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it in great detail Allah says about that difficult time Hunalika abtuliya al-mu'minun wa zulziru zilzalan shadida at the time of Ghazwat Khandaq 
the people were tested and they were severely shaken. If any of you are familiar with Arabic, this concept of the verb being repeated is called maf'ul mutlaq. It's for emphasis. So the Muslims were shaken very, very severely. How so? All of the disbelievers had basically ganged up, thousands of them. And they had just camped outside Medina and they were basically waiting for the provisions and the food and the drink of the Muslims to run out so that they could come in and attack them. So everybody thought they're going to die. At that point, the separation between the attitude of the believers and disbelievers is mentioned in great detail in the Quran. And I wish you can read Surah Al Ahzab. I don't have time to go into it right now. But Surah Al Ahzab is a great example of the attitude of believers versus non believers or people who are weak in their faith when they are faced with difficulty, with adversity, and especially with a difficulty that is as difficult as a person losing his life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that in the Quran and I won't go into great detail there, but I'm going to just talk about one snippet of this, that story, what happened. We know that according to the opinion of Salman al-Farsi to protect the people of Medina, what was going to be done, that they're going to dig a trench and that's why the battle is called Ghazwat Khandaq. Something unique, something that had never been done in the history of warfare in the Arab lands. There was a point in the digging of this trench that a rock came in between the people that were digging and basically they could not move this rock. They tried their hardest and remember during this time the Sahaba had come and complained to the Prophet ﷺ. They had lifted up their shirts and showed the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, we are so hungry, we have to tie our rock to our stomach. The Prophet ﷺ himself, he raised his shirt and two rocks were tied to his stomach. That was the difficulty that they were facing. Facing starvation, thirst, illness and ultimately they were facing death. In that situation, the Prophet ﷺ, he climbed into the trench himself. He took a pickaxe and he started hitting this rock. The first time it hit the rock, sparks flew out. And in these sparks, the Prophet ﷺ declared that I see victory over the Roman Empire. Just imagine that, mind-boggling. They have rocks tied to their stomach. They don't know where their next meal is coming from. They're facing death in the form of these soldiers that are encamped outside Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ is declaring, he's declaring that I see the destruction of the Roman Empire in these sparks that are flying out of this rock. He hits it a second time and sparks are flying out of this rock. And he says, I see the destruction of the Persian Empire. I see victory over the Persian Empire in these sparks. The third time he hits it again. And he says, I see victory over the Syrian lands in this and or Yemeni lands in these rocks in these sparks. Again, baffling and mind-boggling. But the attitude that the Prophet ﷺ is showing his followers is that even in this adversity, we're not supposed to lose hope. We're not supposed to give up hope. And ultimately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did grant them victory. The munafiqeen, at that very difficult time, they stood up and they started saying, مَا وَعَدَنَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا All these promises that we've been given about victories and help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and conquests, all of these things that we've been told over the years, 
All of these were just lies. That's what the Munafiqeen said. You know what the believers said? They said, Hada ma wa'adan Allah wa Rasuluh. This is what Allah and His Prophet have promised us that it's going to happen. We're going to be faced with difficulties and adversities. And the believers, when they were faced with this difficulty, it increased their iman and increased their submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how we're supposed to be when we are faced with difficulty and adversity. This was the attitude that the Prophet ﷺ had when he faced these difficulties. So there were many, many things that also happened to the Prophet ﷺ. Go into them right now. I mean, if you think about that the Prophet ﷺ, before his prophethood even, what happened to him? Number one, before he was born, his father passed away. So he's basically, he comes into this world and he's an orphan already. At the age of six, his mother passes away. Again, the most two beloved people to a person are his parents. The people that one turns to for support and for solace and for, you know, for comfort. The parents, they are gone at the age of six. And then the grandfather takes over, takes the place of the father. The grandfather takes care of him. After a few years, he also passes away. He comes into the care of his uncle. So by the age of about 11 or 12, all the Prophet ﷺ has seen is basically death in his family. Yes, he was from a very noble lineage and his family was very supportive. But still, the loss of the parents is a huge test for anybody. So before prophethood, you had these trials and tribulations. After prophethood, when he started preaching the message, there were difficult hurdles that he had to cross. The Quraysh basically tried tactic after tactic to try to dissuade the Prophet ﷺ from preaching his message. The first tactic was that they came to Abu Talib and they tried to tell him that, look, your nephew is basically causing trouble. He is trying to break the status quo. He is causing problems for us. Please tell him to stop. So Abu Talib basically at that point told them, it's okay, I'll take care of it. And he sent them away in a nice way. Later on, when the Prophet ﷺ didn't stop, then they came back with more threats. They said that if you don't stop this nephew of yours, then we're going to disgrace both of you. At that time, Abu Talib was forced to talk to the Prophet ﷺ and tell him that, you know, it's getting difficult for me. I'm getting old and you're doing what you're doing. I'm not going to stop you in doing that, but just think about what you're doing. You're causing rifts between families. You're causing difficulty for me, so please stop. So these were the tactics that the Quraysh employed to try to uh, stop the Prophet Sallallahu from uh, doing this uh, da'wah work. After that, they started throwing false accusations at the Prophet Sallallahu which are mentioned throughout the Quran. First of all, they said he's a majnoon. He is afflicted with a jinn. وَقَالُوا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ نُزِّلَ عَلَيْهِ ذِكْرِ إِنَّكَ لَمَجْنُونَ The Qur'an describes them talking to the Prophet ﷺ, O one upon whom this dhikr has been revealed, indeed you are majnoon, you are crazy. So they accused him of being crazy. They accused him of being a sahib, a magician. وَعَجِبُوا أَنْ جَاءَهُمْ مُنْذِرٌ مِّنْهُمْ وَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا سَاحِرٌ كَذَّابٌ they were astonished that a person should come amongst them and preach to them the, this message of Islam. And they said, this is simply a lying magician that has come into our midst. So they accused him with this false accusation of sihr. And again, remember, the respect that the Prophet ﷺ had before prophethood, as-sadiq, al-amin, the trustworthy one, 
the truthful one and now all of a sudden it's completely changed and he is now a sahir and a majnoon and a liar na'udhu billah they accused him of lying وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا إِفْكٌ إِفْتَرَاهُ وَأَعَانَهُ عَلَيْهِ قَوْمٌ آخَرُونَ They said that this is simply a fabrication that Muhammad has been bringing. And other people are helping him in this fa fabrication. They accused him of bringing stories of the old, tales of the old. And they said, وَقَالُوا أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ اكْتَتَبَهَا فَهِيَ تُمْلَ عَلَيْهِ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا These are the tales that are being dictated to him. And he brings them night and day. He writes them down night, night and day. And then they said that the Qur'an is not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is just a fabricated thing. It's a human-made thing. وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُمْ يَقُولُونَ إِنَّمَا يُعَلِّمُهُ بَشَرٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says indeed we know that they're going to accuse you and tell you that a human being has taught him these words of the Qur'an this is not from Allah but rather this is from the this is from a human being so these are the accusations that the Prophet ﷺ faced so this was a test that the Prophet had to face when these things didn't work they started ridiculing him and making fun of him and, and, and taunting him. This is also mentioned in the Quran. Basically, the gist of the verse is that did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only find this person to be a prophet? Again, this is alluding to the story of Ta'if. One of the most difficult times at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, with which I'll finish inshallah. There are so many other stories. The story of Ta'if, it's mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ went to visit the people of Ta'if because they were very influential in the community. And he thought that if he could talk to them and invite them to Islam, then it would make a big difference in inviting other people. So he went and he met the three chiefs of the people of Ta'if and each one of them had a very a very demeaning attitude to the Prophet Sallallahu and they said words which were not even worthy of a normal downtrodden human being let alone the Prophet and then on top of that after insulting him that way they basically threw him out and not only did they throw him out they basically sent street urchins after him, the boys of the streets after him, to throw stones at him. The Prophet ﷺ, if you can imagine. And he was pelted with stones. He was pelted with stones until he was covered in blood. From head to feet. His feet, his shoes were covered in his own blood. Just imagine, you know, we have this attitude of saying, well, I did this for my masjid. I did this for my community. I did this for the organization. Did you bleed this way like the Prophet ﷺ bled? This is the question we need to ask ourselves. Did we ever face that kind of difficulty? Did we ever fa face that kind of trial or tribulation? We have never and probably we never will. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that kind of test. It was at that time when the Prophet ﷺ came to his senses that the angel Jibreel came to him and told him, O Prophet of Allah, the angel of these mountains is ready and waiting for you. All you have to do is give the command. Give the order and we're going to crush this village of Ta'if between these two mountains. Just give the order. All you have to do is give the order.